Yes, hello. Hello, this is Adam Smith calling from the website of the Nobel Prize. Uh, am I speaking to Michel Devere? Yes, uh, unfortunately, there's a conflict. There is a, an organization with the NobelPrize.org, and they. That's me. There was maybe a confusion. No, you... that's me. That's okay. I'm. I, I'm the one calling from NobelPrize.org. <laughs> There's been a, a little confusion. <laughs> it's been a confusing week, generally, and it must have been a very confusing d two days for you. <laughs> well, um, I guess it has been like when you receive the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that pretty much sums it up. I agree. How, how did the news actually reach you? Well, uh, you know, when uh, I, I, I woke up uh, at 7 a.m. California time, on Tuesday, and uh, there was a lot of activities on my cell phone and on my computer, but I thought it was a joke. I, I didn't take it too seriously, and then it, it seemed uh, intense. So just to be sure, I uh, I um, called my daughter, who uh, is living in Paris, so she's uh, nine hours out uh, ahead of me, and I was able to, to then uh, see that this was for real. Yes, he, she had had some time to live with the news for a while. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So. <laughs> Plus, uh, I had completely forgotten that October was, um, you know, Nobel Prize month. So I, <laughs> completely unprepared. Yes, completely unprepared. And, and you know, some physicists may, uh, may feel some anxiety at the beginning of October, but, you know, that was absolutely my state <laughs> of mind um, at all. Luckily, you had a proper night's sleep before you had to confront the press, so you were well, yes, well, well yes, prepared. Yes, yes the same, it's a, a, similar, a, a similar story happened to John Martinez, whose wife uh, did not wake him up, as, uh, as I'm sure you... you yes, heard. indeed, he told us. It was so generous of her to take all the flack herself for a few hours, <laughs> yes. Indeed, John Martinez and John Clark have both spoken so warmly of that time 40 years ago when you were working together in the lab in Berkeley and how there was such a lovely interchange of ideas between the three of you. How do you remember those years, 82 to 84? Yes, I, uh, I, I, uh, you know, I have similar memories. I, uh, this, these are very, very fond memories of this uh, work in the lab um, working on a, a fundamental question of physics uh, in a way that was totally free. We could, uh, you, you know, we could mull over what uh, the experiment was meaning and uh, it was marvellous. <laughs> and it's interesting that, um, well, all three of you from different places, but you end up working on the west coast of the US. And indeed, I think six out of nine of the scientists announced this week um, uh, who've been awarded the Nobel Prize have ended up working on the West Coast. What is it about the environment that makes it so productive, do you think? Well, the West Coast of, um, of the United States uh, has been described by a friend on the East Coast a long time ago as the America of America. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a, that's a, a good short description. Um, it's doubly American in some sense, and there's still a a marvelous sense of adventure, and uh, <clears throat> and also uh, Berkeley is a lovely university, uh, yeah. extremely um, well placed on the Pacific coast with marvelous views of uh, the Golden Gate. <laughs> <laughs> this is a wonderful environment, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah indeed. <clears throat> uh, and you've worked in different places, and you you seem you like to work on grand challenges. Um, now you find yourself as chief scientist at Google Quantum AI. What, are, what sort of challenge attracts you? What sort of problem do you like to get to grips with? Well, you see, uh, so we were lucky uh, 40 years ago to be able to work on a very fundamental problem, a very fundamental question that uh, is at the heart of uh, the uh, the formulation of uh, the quantum mechanics. But um, very luckily for us, our initial discovery uh, was uh, developed by many labs uh, around the world. Uh, this became uh, bigger than us in some sense, this uh, mm. whole work, uh, uh, international work on quantum superconducting circuit. And, 
And Google uh, recently um, has been in the front line for creating quantum superconducting circuit with which you could do start to do uh, quantum computing and, and in particular quantum error correction, which is essential in the in the building up of a large-scale quantum computer. So this is what has attracted me uh, and um, to work at Google. They, they were developing uh, these circuits for quantum computation. Mm. Actually, as you know, John uh, had the vision that uh, these circuits could be scaled up. And, and in some sense, uh, he, he, he's part of the foundation at Google of their work on quantum computation. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary to observe the development. It takes time, though. <laughs> It takes time. Yes, uh, yes, I think we we can say <laughs> that uh, indeed uh, from uh, from an initial uh, discovery to the start of an industry, uh, you see, you have uh, you have many decades. Yeah, it's an extraordinary thing to witness and and be involved in. Are you surprised by your own evolution from fundamental questions now to attempted application? I think really, you know, um, I would say that. Uh, a fundamental discovery really becomes true uh, when uh, when actually you can apply it to something uh, concrete. Mm. You know, I've I've been inspired by uh, other scientists uh, and uh, particularly those who were able to conduct uh, both uh, fundamental research and applied research at the same time. So. Um, my model was actually uh, John Clark. Um, I joined this laboratory because uh, I um, I was uh, uh, you know extremely impressed by the fact that he was uh, conducting fundamental research on superconductivity, but he, he was also working on squids, uh, which are uh, sensing devices uh, with many many applications. This uh, combination of fundamental research and application. Mm, mm. We have a glorious predecessor, Lord Kelvin, uh, one of the founding fathers of uh, thermodynamics, and he played also an immense role in electromagnetism. And he uh, was um, part of a company that created this telegraphic line between uh, uh, the United States and England, uh, this uh, transatlantic uh, telegraphic line. So he had this activity both in... uh, very fundamental uh, science, but at the same time, um, really, uh, it, it's quite obvious that he participated. T- he participated into a large-scale uh, industrial application of electricity. Mm. It's fascinating to look back at those who have trod the path before and to make the comparison. Very interesting. Mm. <laughs> so, how much of a disruption is all of this going to be to your work? <laughs> Well, it's a disruption, but at the same time, you you know, it will allow me to uh, speak to um, young students and um, come do my share in in essentially, um, um, you know, uh, speaking for for the interest of science and uh, and give back in some sense because uh, I have myself been uh, very impressed by scientists uh, who were able to explain their work in uh, simple and clear terms. So, It is wonderful to hear you say that you, you want to give back to young scientists and engage with them. We learn science at school, but uh, it resonates completely when you see a scientist. You, you, you really see the freedom and the independence of mind that is not uh, always apparent in, in school programs. The personification yeah. of great science is so, so much more approachable than the dry textbook. Yeah. It's been a huge pleasure speaking to you and I, I wish you a relaxing and wonderful weekend when it comes. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Thank you. You just heard a special episode of Nobel Prize Conversations. For more listening, we think you'll enjoy our brand new bonus episode, where Adam reveals what really gets our laureates celebrating. You can hear it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.